welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar uh, on the topic of reverse mergers, uh, planning and executing a path to public capital. So we're joined here by uh, Michael Cuniff uh, from Danforth Advisors, uh, David Stewart from Latham and Watkins uh, and Luke Marshall from DFIN. Uh, we are awaiting uh, our final speaker, Alan Selby from Stiffel, uh, but we will just wait a couple of moments uh, for him to join. Uh, until then though, uh, just a couple of points before we begin. Uh, any questions for the panel, please do post in the Q&A function uh, just there at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be launching a few polling questions throughout the webinar uh, to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, and anything else, uh, please do make use of the chat function uh, also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, so until then, uh, Michael, uh, I'll just hand over to you. Uh, we'll work to get Alan with us uh, also um, and let me know uh, when you would like to have the polling questions uh, yeah. up and running. Yep, perfect. So thanks, Adam. Um, so welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session. Um, we are going to be, as mentioned, covering off the topic of reverse mergers. Um, we chose this topic because it's it, it seems to be a theme that's coming up more and more and more again. And I, and I guess this generally reflects you know, the challenging capital markets and, the, you know, the small volumes of IPOs at the moment. And so as people start to think about alternate pathways to the capital markets, we thought it would be a good time to kind of go through this topic and, and just refresh. Um, I think that being said, um, you know, in discussing it with the panel, we're certainly not picking this topic as a suggestion that we're expecting a huge avalanche of these transactions to come in. We're not sort of suggesting that, you know, the reverse merger is going to be the new IPO type thing. But but given, you know, I think, I think it'd just be good to have a conversation so we can understand, you know, and look at these as alternatives and, and just get to know them a little bit better. Um, so we do actually have a, there's a lot of ground to cover on the topic of reverse mergers, and we are going to do our best to get through it in much as much as we can in in 60 minutes. Um, in terms of how we're going to structure the session, we're going to spend a little bit of time on just some background of reverse mergers. Then we'll move through into talking more about how you get these transactions done, essentially, and then we'll pivot into what happens after the transaction or sort of you know life after the reverse merger. Um, I wanted to put in just a few general caveats. So we are going to focus on the NASDAQ as the exchange when we refer to capital markets. And so therefore, there'll be some references to SEC regulation, et cetera. And there will be a bit of a US bias. Obviously, you can do reverse mergers on a number of exchanges. But given this is life science, we tend to think about the NASDAQ as the default. So just context there. Um, also, in talking about these transactions, we're going to be sort of considering that both parties, so both the target you know, and, and the acquirer, are, are also life science companies. So again, just quickly recognizing reverse mergers can, you know, can happen between two companies that are industry agnostic. But you know, for this conversation, we're just going to talk about life science companies. I um, also just want to cover off, cover off as well that we're not going to be talking about SPACs as well. They are a form of reverse merger. They're a whole topic in themselves and we'd you know, be better off doing it justice in a, in a separate session. So we're not going to be getting into SPACs. Um, not quite sure who we have on the call. So we're going to assume it's a UK EU blended audience as well. So with that all out of the way, I guess, Adam, it'd be helpful just to learn a little bit about kind of where people are at so we can help level set the conversation. So Adam's got a couple of poll questions he's going to send out. Um, so Adam, can you send those through for the group? I think the first one is whether people have been involved in an IPO. So Adam's got question four. So we can do question four, which is in the past six months, out of interest, are people hearing more or less or about the same about reverse mergers? So I think we'll give 15, 20 seconds, Adam. Can you, right, okay, good. So based on that, about two thirds are hearing more about reverse mergers, so it's good. So the topic is topical, that's what we want. Um, only a really small group of people hearing less. Okay, so that's really good. I guess, Adam, do you wanna kick off just quickly the other questions around just who in the audience has done an IPO and who's done a reverse merger before? So I guess question one. So just really quickly, you know, 10, 15 seconds, has anyone done an IPO before? Uh, 
Brilliant. Okay, so a lot of people haven't. I guess that should be helpful. So we'll bear that in mind as we talk about particularly some of the transaction formats, exactly when we get there and comparisons to IPOs. Uh, I guess, Adam, next question. Yeah, who's who's been involved in a reverse merger? Okay, so most people haven't, which is, you know, not what not hugely surprising, given you know they're not as frequent as an IPO. Uh, and then Adam, can you get us into the next one, which is, has anyone been involved in the acquisition of another business? Because that's also kind of part of what you know, part of the elements of a, a reverse merger. Um, um, yeah, okay, a little, little more than half have been involved in acquiring a business. Okay, good. Um, so I guess then let's get into the background and level setting about it. And so, David, I might throw the first question to you, really, which is at, at a high level, could you just give us like, what, what's the 30 second description of, you know, what is a reverse merger transaction? Yeah, of course. Thanks, Michael. Um, so a, as you were saying, the, a reverse merger is in a nutshell, just one of many tools in the toolbox for how management and shareholders and founders would want to take their business public along with an IPO, direct listing, you mentioned SPACs. Reverse merger usually comes along when um, an exciting and dynamic, usually growth company, biotech or tech, uh, identifies an already publicly traded company that's, um, that is no longer a functioning business or has very little business left and is looking to stay public and to kind of reinvent itself by entering into a transaction where it acquires or is acquired by the private company and therefore the private company becomes public in essence uh, by merging into an already public company. The um, Sometimes these are called distressed companies or zombie companies. That's a bit unfair. Sometimes they're just simply biotechs who had an interesting idea, raised some capital and then couldn't get past the stage trial and ended up sitting on cash and having a public float and they're looking to redevelop. Um, many, many famous companies actually started out as uh, something else and then reinvented themselves. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting too, I also hear the term sort of fallen angels bouncing around, around a little bit, which feels a little dramatic, but it's again, it's another term people like to use. Um, I think the other one I hear too is cars without engines is sort of another one where basically the life science company, the LEAP, the LEAP program hasn't gone ahead. Um, I guess, Alan, maybe throwing to you for a little bit. Um, just thinking about the company that's publicly listed, that's you know the, the the quiet company. What does their world look like? I mean, how how are they seeing things? Obviously, they're in a, an interesting position for the publicly listed company. But how how do they view the world, and what's what are they trying to achieve? Um, to be honest, that's very different based on uh, on the company, the composition of the board, and and uh, how badly they've fallen on. Typically, how badly they've fallen on, let's say, some phase two or phase three failure. Um, in addition, also, how much cash have they got left um, with nothing to do with it? Hence the uh, cars without engines type of uh, analogy. Um, I guess the real pressure, given that we're really talking about US uh, reverse mergers here, is that um, you know boards, management teams have a very clear obligation to deliver shareholder value. It's very hard to do that if. You've got a lot of cash in the bank and really all you're doing is paying salaries without uh, really delivering anything material. Uh, you know, a lot of these biotechs that fail will typically have, let's say, a phase two, phase three failure, and then the next product in the pipeline will be preclinical, maybe entering phase one, and the potential to actually have some form of good news anytime soon that's gonna move the market is incredibly small. Uh, if you look, you know more broadly at what you could describe as a potential target for a reverse merger you know there's something in the order of 200 companies right now on nasdaq that are trading below cash any one of those could be deemed to be a potential target for a reverse merger um even though probably half of them will uh, claim that uh, they're just being absolutely battered by the market and this you know good news coming if only they can get to that endpoint and their study 
at some point soon and the market will find out. Um, usually what happens is, uh, you know, the board puts a lot of pressure on the management team to say, right, this has happened, we've had that bad news, How, what are we going to do now? Uh, and, and they uh, effectively uh, on, you know, encourage the company and direct the company to make a formal announcement on the basis that they, as usually as um, representatives of the funds that have got into the company, either pre-IPO or at IPO, are very keen to see a return on that cash. And so looking for uh, some form of merger um, for their company to do something with that cash, potentially use the liquidity being listed on the market. Um, that's really what, uh, um, uh, that's really a, a question of, you know, what else is out there that they can do. Um, and uh, then the next step for them is really that they either run a formal process to, uh, by hiring a bank and saying, right, what is out there that we could actually potentially merge with? Or they just basically um, will be open to discussions and, and take the first uh, attractive offer uh, that comes along. I don't know if I'm supposed to answer Peter Jensen's question. Um, of the 200 companies on NASDAQ mentioned trading below cash, what percent of biotech? Uh, I believe all, if not substantially all of them are. Um, Michael, did I answer your question or did I miss anything yeah. out there? Sorry. No, it, no, that was really, really helpful. And I think the interesting bit, the, the bit I wanted to kind of drill into now was really this kind of this board mandate to to just come up with a strategy to resolve the public yeah. company situation so there's that environment going on. You've also got shareholders in the background of you know, the existing, sort of existing shareholders in these companies. You've also got the pressure of do you do something or do you return the cash? So I think that's an interesting dynamic. Yeah. I, I guess. Yeah, I might throw to David a little bit, just, just you know, moving around. But in terms of the 200, I mean, like, what what transaction volume do we kind of anticipate? I guess you know, are these frequent transactions? Are we sort of thinking okay, a lot of the 200 are going to become reverse merge targets? Like, how do we think about this a little bit? Uh, I think it's fair to say that ultimately none of those will remain independent companies. It's highly likely that not one of them will remain independent companies, uh, either because uh, they'll get to some form of positive data, it excites the market and someone will buy them, or they'll raise enough money to get to the next stage and then someone will buy them, um, or they will run out of cash, um, or they'll end up in some form of merger with some other biotech to do something whereby effectively the combination of uh, their cash and relatively, and by relatively, I mean relative to whatever else is going on in the public markets, the relatively uninteresting pipeline that the market is not valuing, they may find another listed company that is low on cash but has a more interesting pipeline. And by putting the two together, you create a more robust entity that maybe can potentially either go longer, further, or even get to commercialization. And I guess, David, can I throw to you a question? Is in thinking about these companies and these, these targets, do you see any differences between US and UK or European biotechs engaging in these transactions? Or is it really just down to a company as a company in science and science and progress? So you're talking the, about, oh, oh, sorry, David. David, David yeah. yeah. It's sorry. a great question. I think that from a, from an operations perspective and from a diligence perspective, you know, whether it's biotech or fintech or whatever kind of tech it is, a company is a company is a company. In, in terms of being prepared for the, um, these types of transactions, U.S. domestic targets tend to be better prepared just because they already have uh, U.S.-based auditors. They they're either already have what are called PCAOB audited financials or they're able to uplift their numbers quickly. Uh, European or outside of the U.S. companies, um, even though they may be, frankly, better targets at times, they're, they, they're not accustomed to the cadence and the pace of preparing numbers uh, yeah. that are PCAOB ready, and they're, they need a little bit more ramp-up time to get ready to uh, become a U.S. registered company. That being said, it's not, it's not beyond the art of man. A lot of these targets are startups. They have relatively limited operations, and they can fairly quickly get their numbers together. They just, it's a matter of weeks or months, not years. Uh, in order to be ready. Otherwise, um, generally pretty similar process, pretty similar thinking from the lawyer and accounting perspective. And then from the marketing perspective, of course, it's just a question of 
how quickly can you get to research and coverage and how well known is the name and the sponsors or the or the scientists who are running the the tech Great thing. let's pick up the investor relations piece I, we've got that a little bit further down the line yeah. so we'll get to that a little bit more i think just quickly to comment on the accounting side of things i i think you know exactly to your point you know as we see with ipos there there is kind of this rapid um maturation that's required in order to be you know, to meet the requirements of a PCA or the audit and also SEC reporting. So, I mean, I think that dynamic is very true. Um, and I think that pressure, what we find a little bit in reverse mergers is actually it increases a little bit because you've not just got your own historical financials, you also have someone else's to deal with. And so, you know, there's a there's a bit, a bit of resource lift to kind of to get, get into that. Um, yeah, and yeah. I, I would add to that, there's yeah. also a bit of an advisor constraint as well, depending on yep. where the company, the target is, uh, is domesticated, just the access to auditors who are able to do that work and, and available, it's a bit tougher outside of the US. And you just need to think about that a little bit more in advance. Yep, that, that's, that, that's absolutely true. I guess, Luke, to throw a question to you, just to sort of bring it to the discussion a little bit, in terms of the infrastructure um, and, and supporting these types of transactions, I guess, do you see them as different to IPOs in terms of what people need to support it? Or Yeah, thanks, Michael. Um, from, from our perspective, um, you know, we're providing the this kind of the scaffolding for these deals with things like data rooms. No, I think largely the, 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 the data that needs to be uploaded into these deal rooms are, are broadly the same. Um, I guess the difference is potentially from a classical IPO uh, might be that, um, you know, we've sometimes seen uh, two data rooms being set up for, for either entity and there's a bit of um, mutual diligence going on. Uh, and then maybe you might have a side agreement with with who uh, pays for what, whether it's 50-50, whatever that might be. And then we've also seen um, post deal, uh, there is more of an onus in terms of keeping a data room open for longer to perform any sort of post post deal integration discussions, managing stakeholders, investors, that kind of stuff. There's a lot of work to unpick there. Okay, and then and then on top of that, I guess you've got just the general reporting of the structure that happens after day one as you start to file with the SEC, et cetera. But, yeah, I mean, but the hard work starts kind of once the deal's done and then you've got to be, act as a listed entity and you've got all of the fun and games in terms of jumping through the SEC hoops um, that you know an inexperienced management team are in for a big shock unless they've potentially um been been coached or, or have done it before um so yeah there's there's certain things that we'd recommend to our clients in terms of you know there's technology that you can use yeah. to automate some of the reporting uh, requirements um that hopefully can potentially give uh, a bit of a less of a headache for these guys because they we've come through a horrendous not horrendous but a busy time in terms of getting the deal done and they're all of a sudden they're faced with uh, a lot of expectation from the SEC. So, I mean, given all the fun and excitement, it sounds like these transactions are and accessing public markets in general. I am going to park the question, which is, why do people do this? We're going to park that. We're going to pick that up at the end. Um, but I think let's let's jump a little bit into the transaction itself. So maybe, uh, I mean, this might be a David and Aaron, you know, trade-off question. I guess could you give us a quick overview? Because often we see this, you know, we hear terminology like S4, F4, pipe, etc. Could could you maybe give us a quick overview of what what are the forms of transactions that we see in a reverse merger? Like what what should we look at? Yeah, sure. So you you have to think about a reverse merger a go public transaction is almost as two transactions. So there's there's the classic M and A work where the two parties diligence each other, they enter into a merger agreement, and, and then there is the actual going public aspect of the transaction, which is preparing what's called for a U.S. domestic company a form S four, uh, for what's called a foreign private issuer, which means a company that's based outside of the United States, a form F four. And that's a that's a document just like a prospectus that one would have for an IPO that gets reviewed by the SEC, goes through two, three, four, sometimes five rounds of comments with the SEC, where the SEC reviews both the target and um, and the already public company and how those two would merge and what how the description of the business works, uh, the financial statements that are being presented, the business case, et cetera. Once once the SEC has um, has approved that document, we say that it goes effective. Once it goes effective, 
then the shareholders on both sides will vote to approve the transaction, hopefully approve the transaction. And once they vote to approve the transaction, then the merger will occur. The target shareholders will become oftentimes majority shareholders or large shareholders in the newly formed merged public company and the shares will be publicly traded. Um, during the course of that, in addition to the shareholder process, we'll work with NASDAQ or NYSE, usually NASDAQ for these companies, uh, to ensure that we're eligible, that we have free float um, and, and other eligibility criteria met so that once we close, we're able to stay freely and publicly traded. There's a lot of jargon and a lot of other documents, frankly, uh, from the merger agreement itself to lockups, which management or founders may be expected to enter into, just like with an IPO, uh, to uh, alternative capital raisings. But really, you can think about two documents, the merger agreement and the S-4 or the F-4 as really what everybody's going to spend the most time working on and talking about. And th there is a question in the chat. I, I, I'll cover timelines sort of in, in, a, in a second. Um, I want to come back to that. I guess, Alan, just to throw to you quickly, you know, there's a lot of discussion about with a pipe, without a pipe. Could you maybe just first of all give us a quick overview of what is a pipe? Because it is a kind of an acronym. Um, and then secondly, just talk about like, why why do you need the pipe? Like if you're acquiring a company that's largely a cash balance sheet, like what would be the role of the pipe? Um, so a pipe is a, uh, uh, it, it is, um, effectively a new, either one or a set of investors that come in at the time of the reverse merger, uh, who subscribe to the deal and invest, uh, a chunk of money depending, you know, and, and there's no predetermined, pre-described, pre-prescribed amounts that need to be invested from a regulatory or other basis. It's all just about, uh, and so, and, and so these funds put in the money uh, into the combination, um, and there'll be various legal uh, catches to it that I'm sure David will describe a lot better than, than I will, and, and different ways to price it and everything else. Um, but effectively, the way it's sized is on the basis of uh, if you've got a uh, two companies coming together, post fees, how much cash is going to be left if there was no money coming in. How much money is required to get the company that's being merged in that's bringing the engine effectively bringing the, the biotech pipeline how much money is required to get that to one or more really high quality inflection points that will be a position at which they would want to raise again um if that number is more than the cash that's in the company uh on the post combination post fees then doing a pipe is an eminently sensible thing to do um you don't have to do that um, some merged company uh, management teams will say, you know what, let's get the merger done. Let's raise money. Once we're merged, you know, there's enough pools of capital that I can knock on the door of uh, that will get a reception. Others uh, will be a lot more conservative about it and say, you know what, I just want to make sure the money's in the bank and that we can run hell for leather. Often it's about how, how big the gap is. If the gap is sort of five to 10 million, usually you can find that uh, through some sort of efficiency, uh, around the forecast or just tightening your belt a little bit or others will um you know want a much bigger raise you know you really want to do that as part of the deal and so therefore look into a pipe uh if the pipe doesn't necessarily fill the whole gap but most of it again you've got to take your, your view on um uh, on what you need and what's your likelihood of finding money elsewhere okay. i don't know if david you want to add to uh anything around when and how to actually uh, you know, the mechanism of putting the cash in and pricing and all that stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with everything you said, of course. Uh, the um, Oftentimes the pipe will run, well, it can run either way, but it, it can run uh, in parallel with the merger agreement negotiation and be entered into simultaneously with the merger agreement. Or it can be done after the merger is signed and there can be marketing done um, once we have an announcement of a deal and then the, the cash is raised. Under either scenario, the, the nature of the pipe is that it's a private transaction. And so on the day of close, what that means is that investors in the pipe will not have registered shares and they'll have to wait usually 30, 45, 60 days until those shares are registered and they can freely trade them. 
that's kind of a that's a little bit of a misnomer though because oftentimes pipes are substantial uh, investors and they'll sign up to a lockup in any event which may run for six months or longer. So the, the timing of registration of their shares is not the most important thing. It's more commercially when the, when the lockup. And so I think David, just, just to kind of drill into that a little bit, so I guess, you know, given that the, the IP is in public equity, do some companies seek doing a reverse merger? with a pipe as a way of accessing additional capital or providers of capital who otherwise couldn't participate in private in, in like a private company certainly i mean so you not and not just pipes into to equity but also um these types of transactions are almost the only way that you could get a convertible in because many convertibles are relying on the fact that there will be publicly traded SEC registered US listed security with with volume and trading and liquidity. So it, it really by by achieving the public listing, it it gives it substantially opens up the universe of potential investors because they see um, a, a path to a liquid exit or at least a trickle out exit uh, that, that they wouldn't have in an otherwise private company. Yep. Okay, great. And Alan, I know you kind of talked a little bit earlier around how the transactions come together in terms of the board seeking strategic advice and talking to investment banks. I guess if you're on the chair of, let's say you're, you're on the manager, you're the executive team of one of these companies, you're thinking about doing a reverse partnership because if that's the direction you want to go in. How, like, how, how do you get the ball rolling? How does this all come together? So does, do, do people come with solutions to you? Do you go through your investment bank? Who, who yep. helps pull the pipe together? Gives a quick run through on how it works. Sure. Or doesn't work, as So, if you go down a formal route where you've made an announcement, hired an investment bank, then effectively it looks like a, a typical auction process. But rather than people saying, here's how much I'll pay for your business, the offer that they make is through the combination, you'll bring X in cash, I'll bring my assets plus a little bit of cash. And for that, I want. X percent of the combined entity <clears throat> and effectively once those offers come in and look you know depending on the time of year and what else is going on and how much cash you've got in in the bank as a as a fallen angel biotech um, you can get as many as 30 40 50 offers depending on what's going on out there um, and then it's beholden upon the board to um, effectively decide which of those that they want to take through into a next round of diligence um, once that's done some diligence and then again update your offer polish it as uh, in whichever way you want uh, you know make the management team and the board very uh, comfortable that you're a company that's ready to do this merger from a perspective of you know your accounts are ready your management team know what they're going to do relative to the management team that are in situ um, <clears throat> and once that is done, the, the deal is signed and announced and, you know, I've made it sound very easy, but, you know, it's a very structured, rigorous process. Where there's companies that don't want to do those structured, rigorous processes, maybe make a softer announcement that they're open to alternatives or, you know, whatever the, uh, the actual formal wording is, um, or they have not made an announcement, but, you know, the board is very clearly agreed that we can't go on, an, uh, on a uh, status quo basis. Uh, what ends up happening is, um, you know, what you would expect. The boards are typically on two or three, four companies. Now other people on other boards, word gets around and people start approaching. You know, often it's because, as I've said, you know, the company may be well have uh, dropped 60, 70, 80 percent on the bad news of a recent failure or they're certainly trading significantly below cash. Uh, and so they will start naturally to get inbound offers of let's do a merger of some kind or other. Um, and really those are a race to who can get there first. There may be some illusion or some reality around uh, a competitive robust process between more than one party. The reality is uh, it can be entirely illusory that there is no process and it's just a case of if you want to take me uh, off my status quo and stop me looking at others, you better give me a deal that I want to do. I guess yeah, you know, one of the interesting things of preparing for this and talking with various people about it was a number of people kind of expressed disappointment where they were like, actually, I've been in the process for one, we did all this work and we got, you know, we got kind of beaten up. So I think maybe one of the takeaways is actually these are quite competitive transactions. Oh, they are. 
yeah. to, to win. So like, you know, I know we use the term like fallen angels, but they're not, you know, as sad as they sound. And actually it's quite, it is quite competitive. Um, I guess another question. Well, I think I'm, just to, before you go into the next question, I, I think historically look at 2020, 21, for example, or even earlier years, when Nasdaq was seen as very much the uh, the holy grail in terms of where you can get access to very clever capital and lots of it, and where you can get access to great valuations, uh, hugely competitive. Uh, however, when um, uh, you know in this sort of market where you know companies are more often trading below cash than not in that sort of mid market, you know there's a, an argument whereby why do people want to go public, um, and it's you know, effectively a reverse merger when the IPO window is shut is just a route that people have to go down to get liquidity, to be able to try and raise cash when for whatever reason they're stuck where they are. So it's, it's by definition in this sort of market, less competitive, but more challenging for other reasons because, you know, why would you want to go down this route that's not as much the holy grail as it was three years ago? Sorry, Michael. That's really helpful. Um, I think just to give you a lot of time, so I want to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So I think we first start thinking about, okay, so we, like, maybe as Luke, when you're on the whole next transaction quite early, what, what's, what does the time range look like and what's the, what's the, what's the, what's the timeline for getting these transactions done? Which might be a how long is a piece of string question, but there's sort of a... <laughs> Should I crack on with that? Or? Did you throw that to me? Who did you throw that to? Uh, Luke, I was going to send you in. Yeah, um, oh, that can be quite um, yeah, situation specific. Um, but without wanting to completely cop out, we'd probably be looking at about six months in engagement, I'd say. Yeah. Okay, great. I think David's nodding. So if you have to. I agree with that. I mean, it yeah. can be. It is four months a minimum with your SEC process and your proxy and your vote. And then the question, the piece of string question is really how long does it take to strike a deal and find a target and and to actually enter into a merger agreement? And that's going to be at least two months, could be longer. Quite often is. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I think let's then move forward a little bit to, you know, this transaction being done. You know what what happens after? Like, what does it mean now for the for the company? So, I mean, I think I think in general, like having gone through this kind of huge transaction task, it's a congratulations. You're now a public company, and and there's you know all the regulatory requirements that come with that. So it's sort of ongoing, you know, ongoing PCOB level audits. It's SEC reporting based on the, the calendar and cadence. Um, I guess in terms of a. a, a Question. I mean, Luke, what what do you often see as like the challenging areas for, for management teams after one of these deals closes? Yeah, I mean, when, when you look what at it operationally, do I go on? What you say? Yeah, I'm sorry. What what support do they sort of come to you look to look for? Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's some key considerations that we try and impress upon uh, management teams just just to think about because obviously you're so lost in the deal and it's such a huge kind of impact on you in terms of time and resource. Um, but we do try to say, look, you know, have you thought about what the once a deal is done? Have you thought about what needs to be done? How much um, work is going to be done post deal? So, we often recommend that the uh, the data room is 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 held open post deal for that kind of post post transaction um, integration play. Um, you know, because the hard works it doesn't stop it, it; it's just getting started, and then it kind of moves almost seamlessly in. We do re also then recommend just having a constant deal room open in the background, continually updated just to allow um, the, the new co or whatever you're going to call it to, to, to be constantly deal ready, um, you know, for either some additional follow on transactions, or as Alan mentioned, you might be wanting to do a secondary raise, um, you know, and, and particularly in a market maybe where it's, there's been a long, um, period of inactivity it's going to be hyper competitive so you've got to be as agile and as nimble as possible so having a good um set of data continually updated is is, is absolutely key and then obviously I, I touched upon it earlier just around the sec um reporting um requirements you know that's that's gets relentless and it's going to be you've got to, you can't you can't have any uh, mistakes so you're going to have a 20f or a 10k annual report uh, and as I mentioned, you know, there, there is technology out there that you can use to collaborate within your finance team to, um, you know, get things uh, done and, and, and try and automate that as much as possible. Because 
what you'll find is there's a huge expectation, a lot of pressure to not make any mistakes. And generally the, the finance teams of these companies are still really lean. So um, yeah, that they'd be the, they'd be the three sort of topics I would, I would try and impress on the management teams post deal. Great. And I guess, David, if I can throw to you a question, which is like, you with the reverse merger, obviously the company, you know, the, the one of the companies has already been public for some time. And so when I think of like being an emerging growth company, that gives you certain extended timelines to do things. Are there any like unintended consequences as a result of doing these transactions? So for example, do, do certain timelines reset, uh, you know, think things of that nature that you might, you know, you might default with an IPO that you automatically get? There can be is the is the honest answer. So for those who have gone through an IPO with the smaller companies and they and have been a foreign private issuer, then they would you would be familiar with a lot of exemptions that are available to being an emerging growth company to being a foreign private issuer, which gives you various relaxation from the rules on how often you have to report, whether you have to do what are called Section 16 files filings, whether or not you can use IFRS or US GAAP. Um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. When your SOX compliance, uh, Sarbanes Oxley compliance is required. The the first thing to note is that many many of the so-called fallen angels will be U.S. domestic issuers. And so therefore, if you want to do a reverse merger into one and you're a foreign company with IFRS financials, you're going to have to switch to U.S. GAAP. So that's just a, a basic blocking and tackling point. And then in terms of whether or not the emerging growth company status is available, uh, it depends. It depends on the history of the issuer, how long they've been public, what their prior revenues are, how they became public, et cetera. It also depends on the target, whether or not it has any revenues. So that may or may not be available. Um, and just generally also, you would look out for things like has the, um, for example, has the, the current public company that you're merging into uh, had to have a restatement done or has it had a late 10k or 20f filing such that it would not be eligible for a, a shelf registration statement within a year or have uh, certain advantages that the SEC gives to well-known seasoned issuers or regular issuers uh, delayed or deferred for some period of time. Things like this you just have to do diligence on. You have to work with your counsel and your accountants and your bankers to kind of to kind of figure out whether any of those traps are there. Yeah, I mean, again, it it, it sounds like again there, there's a, a you know if I think about an IPO pathway to this, it sounds like there's potentially more variables at play. So it's sort of it's not automatic that you're going to trigger some of these issues, but but they could be there as opposed to. Yeah. You know, the, the other thing I, I, I've i heard feedback about, you know, as we've been discussing this in the week is often too, like if you think about an IPO, you're to some extent in control of your readiness program. So you're thinking about going out, you're preparing for things, you're upgrading things. You know, with a reverse merger transaction, you may not be in control of the timeline. You know, you may have to move kind of faster. So actually, you know, these, these can be very difficult transactions to not just pull together, but also survive and, and, and thrive through. Well, I, I mean, I agree with that completely. You know, your classic IPO candidate usually has been thinking about that for 24 or 36 months and has been kind of gearing up for it. You you will have companies like that who want to do a reverse merger, but a lot of your classic candidates are ones who, as Alan was saying, have a problem they need to solve, They and they're solving it by act, trying to quickly access the public markets and find a way to raise capital. And they just haven't geared up. They haven't built the infrastructure that they need to, and they have to do it very quickly. You can outsource a lot of that. You can hire uh, accounting firms. You can hire a PR agencies. You can outsource a lot of support for those first couple of years, but you have to be ready to do that. Yep. And actually, that on, on that topic, Alan, I wanted to throw to you just around, you know, one of the, I guess, one of the, the probably the, the bigger impacts I think about, but, you know, obviously old companies have been doing investor relations with a private company, but that, that activity changes significantly once once you go public. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, what, what changes or what, how do you handle the investor relations upgrade, basically, at the end of a real merger? I'll be honest, I'm not sure. I'm in entirely well placed to... Uh, <laughs> to answer that, I mean, I'm the guy that gets them to signing and, and uh, helps them a little bit beyond there, but not really. Look, I think importantly, 
you've got a whole new set of rules, right? You, you know, the uh, what's insider information versus not is, is fundamentally the key. When you're private, you can say what you want to whoever you want, uh, and uh, you know, it's quite straightforward. Um, if you uh, want to have things limited by confidentiality, great. If not, you know, you, it's your information to pretty much do what you want with because it doesn't impact any share price out there and, and so it doesn't uh, constitute any sort of market abuse. When you've got a listing, um, uh, you've got to be much more careful about what you say, much more diligent, particularly in the US. Uh, you've got to be much more, in general, conservative about what you say is achievable. And uh, you know stuff that you're comfortable is deliverable. Otherwise, uh, uh, you know, God bless. You'll have lots of uh, letters from very expensive lawyers threatening to sue you. And so, um, there's that level of conservatism that you've got to be careful about. Um, I mean, otherwise, it's pretty much, in general, I think, relatively the same. And the big difference, I think, at listed companies. Uh, have versus private is the dynamic of the, the flow around how your um, shareholder structure changes is quite material the, the dynamic and the flow of your shareholder base just can change quite significantly particularly as you're going through these fundamental transactions you get you know all sorts of companies coming into the uh, into the capital structure and, and, and you know either trying to find ways to make money whether it's on the back of the good news or saying actually we don't want this deal to happen we'd rather have a release of cash there's a number of those that have happened in the last year even unfortunately one or two well, one that I worked on most recently um, uh, and then you know I think also you know you'll have them you know, in general you should have a much more stable board when you're a private company when you're a sort of smaller post merger uh, public company it's entirely possible that uh, the dynamics and flow of your board can change quite a lot uh, to reflect the shareholders that you've got. And, and I guess I can add some flavor to the question too, not to add some question, but essentially one of the things that we often see is, you know, there is a significant uplift in, in handling investor relations. You still need to go out and build analyst coverage and all that kind of oh. stuff. And I think typically it's often done during the IPO roadshow. That, that, that's not a part of the first measure as such, that so you kind of miss that readiness, that, that So, you know, I think it's, it's always hard to get in the relations right. It just needs to be professionalized yeah. materially and, and when you're listed. Absolutely and professionalized and to a whole new level. Correct. So I think just thinking about one of the questions I can see in the Q&A, um, I, I, I will answer it for us just kind of really quickly. The question is, so, you know, in terms of fees, how to reverse mergers compare with IPOs? And, and so I, I you know, I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you what I think the answer is, which is we've sort of alluded to all the levels of additional support and help you're going to need. I think the expectation is reverse mergers are not cheaper, are not significantly cheaper than IPOs. Like, you know, there could be a lot of transactional support required. I guess, you know, Alan, thoughts, David, thoughts? Look, thoughts. Uh, uh, go on. I mean, I mean, from a from the auditor and lawyer perspective, I'd certainly agree with that. I mean, I think from and I'll let Alan speak about banking fees. I think that can be more variable depending on the size of the deal. But the the legal and audit work is comparable to an, an IPO. Yeah. Um, there's no right answer for for this in terms of banking fees, and again, it depends on the size of the raise in an IPO. Typically, you're paying five, six, seven percent of. Uh, money raised in an IPO um, plus you know if there's a green shoe option that can be actually quite expensive if the share price does well on the back of the IPO um, and that's you know easy to quantify but no one ever does it because that's the really painful bit um, in terms of uh, on a reverse merger you're paying two sets of bankers typically uh, fees for doing the deal um, and you know depending on how they're structured you know, some banks will even uh, look to get some form of equity or uh, warrant participation in them. So, uh, you know, it's in terms of cash amount, it's possibly much more manageable in a reverse merger. But in terms of absolute value, um, it can be harder to actually work out. And I, I just, I wouldn't use the. Uh, decision around what the fees could be to drive my decision as to whether I was going to do a reverse merger or an IPO.
you know, typically companies that are doing reverse mergers don't have the option to do an IPO for whatever reason. So I guess, David, I've got one question for you, and then I'm just looking at time. So I've got one question for you, David, and then we're going to pivot to the, the, the big question for all of us to answer, and then we've got some space for some Q&A. So I guess, David, we had, we had some questions in, in the lead up to this, which is around, so in a, in a reverse merger, you're, you're obviously acquiring a whole bunch of cash on someone else's balance sheet. But what about the other things that you're you're acquiring? Like there's history and liabilities, and how how does legal approach that? Yeah. So first of first of all, diligence. So we try to work uh, diligently on making sure that we understand what assets and liabilities uh, both sides have and what traps are there, and if, and then we try to limit exposure to our client by having the other side provide indemnities or potentially divest of some asset that we think is toxic or solve some problem in advance. Um, the problem or the challenge, especially with a, a public company being the counterparty, is who's going to be stand behind the indemnity and who is good for it. So if there's a strong founder who has control, then they may be quite happy to provide an indemnity if it's a, well, it's a, a relatively diversified public company shareholder base and you're getting an indemnity from the uh, public company, then after you merge, you're effectively just getting an indemnity from yourself because you are the same company. So you, so that has to be thought about. Um, but so really the best cure is to diligence and try to fix the problem in advance. Okay. And then there, I guess there's also things like, you know, board, board composition and in this as well, so like in reverse mergers, you may actually you know, inherit or end up with board members from the the, Certainly. the other side of the company. So you you would you, well, it, it depends on the economics and it depends on what the public company is actually bringing to the table, other than cash. But you would you would expect most incumbent directors to want to move on, and you would expect the target to want to bring in a, a, a set of board members who are appropriate for that business and that industry. Um, so you, you would expect a relatively clean slate and a relatively amicable break. That could depend on um, uh, employee stock options and other things that, that there's some trigger that makes it prohibitively expensive. But usually with board members, that's not the case unless the company had a relatively high profile board member that had a particularly interesting package. So usually you would expect a clean slate um, unless there's someone there that you really want uh, to be on the board. So then I just want to give it to sort of the, the big question and then we can do some hits on the, the Q&A just to kind of tidy up some of the questions that are out there. So I guess the, the, the big question, and this has come up quite a lot in the last week in talking to people, what, given all given some of the, the technicalities and some of the challenges and some of the, you know, the dynamics of doing one of these transactions, why do people pursue this and why, why, why do people do this? Like why, yeah. I mean, Alan, do you want to go first? You know, Alan? Yeah. yeah, look, I think, as I said, you know, NASDAQ isn't the uh, the promised land that it was two or three years ago. Um, you know, pe people do reverse mergers because there's uh, an opportunity there where they get access to cash now through the company that they're merging with, access to cash later potentially even add in new exciting shareholders for, by inheriting them through the merger um, the exposure can often be quite good uh, getting a share price can actually be quite helpful particularly if you think you're going to transact in the not too distant future and you think you're going to get a re good response so having a share price that means that someone who comes along and says we'll, we'll give you a premium to where you are can help you uh, look like a more attractive target potentially even uh, IPO and gives you validation uh, and so IPOing through a reverse merger can, can give you that validation that uh, you know you're a company that you know big pharma mid-sized pharma should look at to acquire I mean all of these are very valid reasons uh, you know what I would just caution is that given the valuation challenges given the lack of access or reduced access to capital on NASDAQ given the increased cost of being on NASDAQ I think the hurdle for companies to, uh, to to view it as the promised land has certainly gone up. But that said, you know, if there's no cash anywhere else, NASDAQ is still probably a better place to be for lots of other reasons. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I would only add to that that it is, which is really kind of what Alan's saying, is that it is still, um, especially if there's a pipe, it, 
it is a pretty great form of price discovery. And so if you, you know, in addition to raising cash, you, you do get a market valuation, you get a market check. And if you have good research and coverage and liquidity in your stock, then, you know, you, you have better valuations usually than a private company even still. Okay, great. So we've got, um, we've got seven minutes left. So I might just pick off some of the quick, uh, some, a couple of the questions in the Q and A just to kind of close them out and then i guess yeah, maybe we can go around and just go through final final thoughts if people are happy with that so i think one of the one of the questions was around um ftc regulations so i guess are these transactions regulated any differently than than other kinds of mergers or other kind of corporate transactions no i mean there, there are merger controls in various jurisdictions that would have to be looked at but generally no uh, and I think we've, we've covered it all off. So then I think with the final kind of minute or so left, I guess, you know, closing thoughts on reverse mergers. I mean, maybe, you know, we can go in, in order. Luke first, David, then Alan, and then I can close out. Final thoughts. Yep. Okay. So the I think the key, the one key takeaway I'd, I'd ask you to, 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 to think about is just, is just trying to achieve deal readiness. Um, in whatever way you can, um, from our perspective, it is um, creating and uh, maintaining uh, an up-to-date data room with all of the relevant materials and then need to be diligent to those short notice uh, that allows you to be nimble and active and to the market. David? Well, a lawyer always supports deal readiness, so I'm, I'm all for that. Uh, I, I would just say that I think that these are these will continue to be an important tool in the toolbox for certain companies to go public and and they are worth pressing your financial advisors on uh and not to be dismissed um even even in a challenging market so it, it's something that, that a thoughtful board will think about alan thoughts what's our final thoughts on look i think uh having been through enough of these uh, deals um I think getting help is certainly the key. Um, I think if you're a even a mid-sized biotech with lots of people in the C-suite team, you're still going to need a lot of help. Uh, there's just a lot of wood to chop to get these deals done. Um, and uh, you know, the self-serving thing is it's reassuringly expensive. Yeah, I mean, I, I think having sort of you know thought about this topic over the last few weeks to be prepared, I you know what kind of strikes me is like actually being ready for these transactions. They're very complex transactions. It takes a lot of capability and resource. It's unlikely you know you, you're going to need help when you look at these transactions. So it's you know what you can do, you know, what you can think about as part of readiness is who can provide that help and when, and and just be ready to scale. Um, I I don't think any path to the public capital markets is easy by any by any nature um and i think you have to think about not just the transaction but how you're going to survive afterwards and and thrive after that but you know i think getting the transaction done and then sort of you know getting through it are, are often two very different very very different challenges um so with a couple of minutes to go then i think unless there's any final questions that people wanted to to throw into the q a um i, I want to thank everyone for for, for joining today it's been it's been really really interesting and so i think it's been, a, it's been fun pulling all this together for you um i think if there's any questions you know, please feel free to reach out to anyone on the panel here we're happy to take take questions by email linkedin however wherever you want to send them through um and adam i guess you know closing thoughts help us we do that. have one question um, yep. Michael, uh, from mike davis how expensive is expensive on its own and compared to an ipo David, do you want to, do you want to throw that one? What's your, what's I mean, your again, the auditor it? and yeah. legal fees. So interestingly, in a U.S. registered IPO, uh, the underwriters pay for their own legal. So that's kind of not an issue for a target. Um, but but target side, the auditor and legal fees will be comparable. Uh, you know, it will be some, it will, it'll be several million dollars for sure uh once you pay both the auditors and the and the lawyers and the lawyers on the other side as well and and from our perspective for the the data room and the traditional financial printing side it could be 
is it is comparable, which would be two hundred and fifty k in total on average. Yeah, I think I think on our side, you know, depending on how long the support goes for, but I think you know. I would say slightly north of a million for transactional kind of support. Again, depending on the audit fees, depending on the urgency, how fast you're trying to do things. So, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, cost can increase dramatically if you're trying to drive a really quick transaction. You know, you end up just having to pay for more more bodies. Um, and then it depends on how long things go for, like whether you decide to continue outsourcing, et cetera, or build up your own team. But but yeah, I mean, I think north, north of a million comfortably. Right. So I think I think that is the final question. Great, uh, Michael. Thanks so much for uh, putting this discussion together, um, steering the discussion. Uh, Luke, David, uh, Alan. Thanks so much for joining as well, uh, and also thank you to all the attendees um, who signed in today.